Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. You are no doubt familiar with the great parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. It is a powerful story. It's about rebellion and repentance and restoration. It's one of my favorite passages of scripture, mostly because I see myself in that story. And perhaps many of you feel the same way. The focus of the story is usually on the younger son that wanted to get his share of the inheritance and he went his own hard-headed way. Let's talk about that for a minute. He got his money. He got his money from the family of estate before his father passed away, and that's a bit unusual. And he headed out, and he struck out away from home, and he wasted his time and his money on what they call prodigal living. The Bible's never real specific about what prodigal living is, but most of us kind of know, don't we? We've all had our days. We've all had our share of mistakes. We've all known young men to do sometimes foolish things. I was young myself once. I guess that's not funny. I guess that's just not hitting home with you. Don't lie to me, people. I know your story. We've all been there, right? Anyway, he finds himself uh, working for a pig farmer in a far country. Now, for a young Hebrew boy to be working for a pig farmer, that's about as low down as you could possibly get. And he says to himself, what the heck am I doing here? I need to get right and go home. And he humbles himself, and he returns to his father, thinking that perhaps maybe he could get a little corner of the bunkhouse with the servants. But his father sees him coming a long way off, and rushes to greet him and welcome him and restore him. Put a ring on his hand, put new sandals on his feet, put a robe on his shoulders, kill the fatted calf and let's have a party and celebrate because my son who was lost has returned to me and now he is found. It endures because it speaks to us. We see ourselves in that story so clearly. We've all had a time where we wandered far from God and far from home, and we find that our Father is gracious, and he is absolutely about the restoration of souls, the bringing us back to the family. But there's another son in the story, and the other son was the older brother who stayed home, and he worked hard. And he managed his father's estate. And when his younger brother showed up after his wretched and wanton ways, the older brother was none too happy about it. <clears throat> when the father threw a party for the younger son that was <clears throat> so foolish, when the father killed the fatted calf, the older brother was in fact quite angry. So we're going to look into his part of the story today. He's working out in the fields in Luke chapter 15. And he's approaching the house and he sees that there is a party going on. And I invite you to stand as we read the word of God beginning at verse 25. His older son was in the field. As he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. And so he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I may, might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And I want us to think that the older son said, and what's up with that? Just my little 
adding to. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Father God, enlighten us today. Help us to see the truth of your word in this story. Help us to see ourselves and our attitudes about how we can celebrate and rejoice in your presence and in your love. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, please. So last week, we did a sermon that was a little bit about money and how we respond to and use our wealth and how much is enough. And we concluded that message with a passage out of 1 Timothy chapter 6 that said, The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves with many sorrows. You and I have both seen families get divided up over the money, especially when it comes time to the settling of an estate or inheritance. And it seems that the question of who gets what and what did they do with it is the cause of the greatest angst and dissension within a family. And if you've ever been on the short side of that matter, if you are the one that got treated unfairly, you might even begin to understand the older brother's uh, difficulty. If someone took what you consider to be your fair share and wasted it, maybe you can see the reason that this older brother was rather upset. Arguments over money and what's fair and who gets what seems to bring out the worst in us. For the older brother, in his own eyes, he had been loyal and faithful, and the younger brother had been immature and wasteful. So why on earth would that guy get the feast and the party and the fatted calf and all the rest? Not fair. I think I was probably at about the 8th grade, maybe 13, 14 years old. The first time somebody told me, life's not fair, get over it. There is an imbalance in the world, and no, it's not fair. And it's not always going to come out even. And if you want to spend your time justifying yourself why you should get more, what you deserve in comparison to the rest of the world, you're going to be disappointed. Guarantee it. I tell you, too, that God's definition of what is fair and just and right is very different than yours. And furthermore, God is not required to meet your expectations. God will do what God chooses to do, and he will give as he chooses to give. Is it fair? doesn't matter. God is at work. And we celebrate that. This part of this parable reminds me, in fact, of another parable that's found in Matthew chapter 20. It's about the workers in the vineyard. And there was a landowner, and he needed some day laborers, and he went out early in the morning, and he rounded up some guys, and I'll give you a denarius. That's a, (coughs) excuse me, that's a fair day's wage. I'll give you a full day's pay, come work in the vineyard. So they came, and they got to work. About the middle of the day, he wanted to go hire some more, and then early afternoon, he hired some more. And then in the 11th hour, he went out and hired more, and he said, I'll give you what's right. So these guys, they they came in at the last hour of the day. I'll give you what's right. When pay time came at the end of the workday, he said, you guys who came in last, you line up first, and they got a full day's wage. Lucky for them. Nice. Nice. So the guys at the back of the line who had come in early in the morning, they thought that they deserved more. They thought they'd get a bonus because they had worked hard and they'd done so much better. And they got what they had agreed to, a full day's wage, a denarius. They complained about it. They griped about it. They said, not fair, not fair. And the landowner said, did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. The last will be first, the first will be last. It's not going to come out fair, my friends. Do the best you can do with it. Live with it. 
Not even. The prodigal's older brother was comparing himself, justifying himself in his own mind compared to the brother. He's getting more than he deserves, and I don't like it. When we take on the task of comparing ourselves and what we get in life to what the others get, (laughs) you're going to be disappointed. You're going to come out on the short end of it. You're walking on thin ice. Because of ego and pride and this natural inclination we all have to justify the self, you're going to feel like it's treating you unfairly. And you'll always rate yourself above the next guy. You can always find fault in somebody else. If you look, point out to what's not fair in your own life, None of that does you any good, and you are wasting emotional energy about things that have no value or meaning whatsoever. If you're going to compare yourself to anybody, Jesus is the standard. And you will come up short, my friends. You will come up short. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his love, even when life is not so fair. Thank God for his promises that he will always be with us and he will never fail us and he'll guide us through whatever comes our way, whether down or up or down or up again. He's always there and he will give to us as he chooses to. It's called living by faith and trusting in the Lord. I highly recommend it. So down to verse 28, the father came out to speak with the son. And we begin to see the real issue. Notice what the son said in verse 29. Lo, all these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. Yeah, right. I bet he did. And yet you never even gave me a young goat so that I could have a party. Now what's the focus of the man's argument here? I served you, I was faithful, I worked hard, I was good, I was righteous, I, me, myself, and I. I, 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 I. Compare that to the words of the younger brother. Father, give me the portion of the inheritance that falls to me because I want mine and I want it now and I want to do what I want to do and me, myself, I, 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 I. Even the word sin has the I right in the middle of it. And sin is always tied together with putting ourselves first. I want what I want, and I want it now, and I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to meet my needs in the way that seems right to me, and I want the glory, and I want the recognition, and I want the praise for my favorite person in the whole world. That's the core of sin, my friends. Isaiah chapter 14 talks about the fall of Lucifer. Lucifer, of course, was um, one of the angels, perhaps the highest of the angels. And before time and the created order began, he said, I want to be on top. I want to put my throne above. I will ascend into heaven I will exalt myself over the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation, and it's all about me. We fall into that trap, and we fall into that pattern because we want the glory for the self. The older brother is justifying himself, promoting himself, declaring his own righteousness in the sight of the Father. And he's wondering why the Father doesn't meet his expectations. Well, like I said, the Father is under no compulsion to meet your expectations, my friends. What God desires from us is humility and grace. Paul talked about in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's not about me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. John the Baptist said it. He must increase, but I must decrease. We've got to get the self out of the way. We've got to get the ego out of the way. We've got to get the pride out of the way. 
Put to death the self-justification, self-glorifying, trying to convince God of how righteous and good and hardworking and loyal and faithful we are. And the only righteousness that any of us have is the righteousness of Christ that is granted to us. Amen? Another element of the older son's frustration here is that in his mind... The younger brother does not deserve such grace. Doesn't deserve a party and a fatted calf. Now, clearly he was wasteful with what he had. Clearly he'd done all kind of things that would be not so favorable. Life of sin. He had degraded himself, caused all sorts of pain. He didn't deserve a fatted calf. He didn't deserve a party. And the older brother refused to go in and participate in such foolishness. And he looked at contempt down upon them. You see, when you get in the business of justifying yourself and proving to yourself your own righteousness, the very next step is justifying the condemnation of all who are not you. When you convince yourself of your own worthiness before the Father, which our guy has done here, it's easy peasy to point out the flaws and mistakes of everybody else. And then that way we can make ourselves to be judge, jury, and executioner. They're not good enough. He doesn't deserve it because he's not good enough. Let me ask you, my friends, who amongst us is good enough? Who amongst us is so righteous or holy that we have the right to cast the first stone? To look down upon a brother. To stand in judgment or condemnation of any body. Who are we to determine what they deserve from the Father God Almighty? How dare we take on such a role? Do you really want what you deserve from God? Do you really want God to treat you fair? Because God would be fully justified in giving up on the whole lot of this humanity and condemning us all to the wickedness of hell. That would be absolutely within his rights to do because of our own rebellion and recklessness. God would be perfectly justified. But because he is merciful, because he is gracious, Because he loves us, in spite of ourselves, he has made a way. He has sent us his son Jesus, who shed his own blood, who died for us, that through faith in him, we can have hope, and we can have freedom, and we can have restoration to our place in God's family. God chooses to give grace to those who don't deserve it. That's why it's called grace. If it was deserved, it'd be your paycheck, it'd be your salary, it'd be your wages. We don't earn our way with God. We receive mercy. We receive grace. God's whole plan of restoration is based on His mercy and His grace. Romans 9.15 tells us, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. We thank God that he has chosen to have compassion on us. We thank God that he has chosen us to be the recipients of his mercy. God's love is demonstrated through his grace to sinners. While we were still while we were not yet sorted out, before we were ever anywhere close to good Enough. Christ died for us. More than that, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And we receive restoration by faith and in faith. And because of faith, we receive all that God has in store for us. But wait, that's not all. Sound like an infomercial there, don't I? But wait, order before. The older brother is complaining, 
and he's justifying himself and pointing out the flaws and failure of the other. He's angry that he did not get the blessing, frustrated that the other guy got more than was justified. And so the father comes out to talk with him, verse 31 and 32. And he said, son, you are always with me. And all that I have, He said, son. He called him son. Do you recognize that your father in heaven is your father? Yours. Your father. And he has declared you to be part of his family. And that's a powerful thing. Do you recognize that you are a child of the king? We are sons and daughters of the most high God. You belong to him and he belongs to you. He is our father. For some of us, because of the way words work, for some of us that it's kind of weird. For those of us that had a less than spectacular relationship with our own dads on the earth, the idea of God as Father is a little problematic sometimes. Because when I think of Wayne B. Hotailing, my dad, who divorced my mother when I was five, who died an early death due to a life of alcoholism, I could go on for a while, but there's no need. There are sometimes less than fond memories there, okay? There's, hey, I'm 53, I still got baggage, right? Here's how I worked through those things, and maybe this will help some of you today. I've learned that my Father in Heaven is everything that Wayne B. could have been or should have been. And all those things that I had wished for from my dad, my father already is, and always has been, and always will, will be. And that helped me kind of reconcile a few things, and maybe that gives somebody here today something to hold on to, and I hope it does. He said, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. All that I have is yours. Everything that belongs to the Father, we receive. And God offers to his children all the mercy, all the love, all the blessings, all the peace, all the hope, all the joy, all the promises of heaven, all the fatted calves in all the world are all ready Yours. Ephesians 1.3 says that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now how much is that? Because that's got to be a lot. Jesus said, I have come that they would have life and have it more abundantly. That is ours, the abundant life of Christ. Peter said you're a chosen generation and a royal priesthood and a holy nation and his own special people. Paul said you are a new creation in Christ, all the righteousness of God in Christ. It is yours, it is yours, it is yours. All that he has is ours. Why do you suppose this older son felt neglected, felt left out? Why do you suppose the father had overlooked his life and had failed to give him a young goat? Could it be that he was so busy working, so busy serving, so busy doing what he thought was right, so busy trying to prove his worth and his own Righteousness that he misunderstood the whole relationship. The older brother stayed home and worked and served and gave it everything he got. 
because they thought that was going to earn him some points. You don't earn points with God. You receive grace from God. He misunderstood the whole thing. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Why do we sometimes feel that God is distant or not attentive to our needs or our prayers? Or maybe we feel like we have not received all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And maybe I feel like my life in Christ is maybe not so abundant today. Could it be that we have not because we ask not? Could it be that we really don't believe all those promises are for us after all? My friends, all that he has is yours. All that he has is yours if only we would take hold of it and believe it in faith and live it out in fact. There are two prodigal sons in the story. Both of them were lost from their father in their own unique way. The first in rebellion and sin in the outright I'm going my own way. And the second in a much less subtle way of earning his keep and proving his worth before the Father. For the one in rebellion and sin, the door is open for restoration. And he invites you and he welcomes you and he waits and he watches for you because he loves you and I urge you, return to him. For the one who is pointing to their loyalty and service and devotion and labor for the kingdom, thinking that God loves you more because of it, please stop. Stop. Stop trying to earn what you cannot earn. Only receive. Stop trying to justify yourself in his sight. Only receive. Only receive. Know that the blood of Christ is sufficient and he loves you for you. For whoever is far from God today, he offers you restoration and peace and inheritance incorruptible and he puts us to the place we belong in his family. May we receive all that he has in store. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you and praise you for all that you are. We thank you for the rejoicing in heaven when your children return to you from wherever we have been. We pray, Lord, you would guide and bless us in this hour. We pray, Father, that your glory would shine and be revealed in us. We ask your forgiveness where we have failed you, and we give ourselves to you yet again. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close our time with a hymn of, hymn of invitation as we always do. And this is a time for you to respond to what God is doing in your life. I invite you to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Come to him. Humble yourself before him because all that he has is yours. And you will receive it in faith as we trust in Jesus alone. Whatever prayers or burdens are on your heart, I'm happy and honored and blessed to pray with you and for you. Would you stand, please? If you have a need, you come now. my prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.